this is Jacob Proctor uh, speaking with Matt Saunders um, on September 3rd, 2020 um, for the Archives of American Art uh, Pandemic Project. Um, Matt is speaking from his apartment in Manhattan and I'm speaking from my apartment in Brooklyn. So Matt, thank you so much uh, for talking with us and being, or talking with me and being a part of this. Um, I guess like the biggest question is, you know, how has it been since all of this began, what, five, four or five months ago? Um, where were you when it all, when things started to really uh, go downhill? That's a huge question. Um, well, first, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for having me. Um, so I am, I, I, I teach uh, up in, up at Harvard um, and generally move around a lot. I have a studio up there um, and then I have a, a space in Berlin and an apartment in New York. And so my life has been kind of triangulated. Um, I was up there in the middle of the semester, um, right before Harvard spring break, which was when things kind of came into focus. They, you know, they sent all the students home, told them that everything was running online. Um, and I immediately came down to New York thinking I would be teaching remotely for the semester and I could be down here, but I stayed in New York for about a week and it became clear that I, um, it wasn't a great place to be in the middle of March and I didn't have a, a good internet connection. Like I, I, I went back up there and I, so I spent most of the pandemic up in Cambridge. Um, and it's been a kind of sense of widening circles ever since, but I'd say basically from March until the beginning of June was just sitting in a concrete box in a tall apartment building. <laughs> um, one of the main things for me is I got locked out of my studio. That's been one of the biggest impacts um, is that I, uh, my, main, my main studio during the semester, I have a big space and a separate color dark room that I've built up in Boston, but they are buildings that belong to the university and um, the university shut everything down and it took several months to get access again. So I really got um, kind of shut out of a big part of my ability to do anything except cook, teach online, and stew in this box in the sky. That's amazing. I, I, that's crazy that you were shut out of your studio as well. And how was, I mean, how was it teaching studio classes remotely? We could, I mean, we could spend the whole interview on that easily. I am. Um, I was teaching a, a brand new course that I had just invented within the general education program at Harvard. So whereas we normally have sort of smaller studio courses in the art department, this was a 72 person course, studio art painting course, lectures um, that fulfilled the general requirement for students. So we had, you know, 400 people lotteried for it. It was a big deal course and it turned out to have been a kind of blessing because um, it was super organized. So when we moved online, I spent one day shipping materials to all the students using the same shopping cart in blick.com and <laughs> sending it to their home addresses and then had quite a positive experience with it. Actually, um, there was something intimate about the lectures became somehow strangely intimate because I was sitting in my, basically in my bed, <laughs> like <laughs> talking into the computer. Um, and I think that those, that activity, like working with, you know, their very first steps in art making was, um, was hard for some people, to, for some of the students to figure out how to set it up at home, but it became uh, a break from all the other Zoom time and all the other things that we're doing. So I felt like the class like snapped into gear at that point. We had, um, so some people got lost. I think everybody had that experience teaching in this moment. Some students really, got lost in health issues, mental health stuff. It was, there was a lot of care. Um, but I felt like it was uh, kind of energizing. But it became all consuming for me. I mean, that's, you know, I'm speaking uh, I, as, as an artist and um, I've always balanced my own work and the teaching and I really, you know, took those two months from March until May and, and was 100% present in the teaching. And it's been tricky to come back from that. First, mm -hmm. having, you know, there was a dead month of not getting into the studio and then even just kind of reorienting yourself to the whole world 
shifted. And um, I spoke about this with a lot of people. I, I think both, both through the anxieties of COVID and through um, all of the sense of, of urgency and frustration and, and powerlessness that maybe came up um, with the Black Lives Matter resurgence, a lot of artists I know who also have other roles leaned in heavily to their institutional frameworks. I, I saw my contact with the, with the students and the sort of, you know, I was in the of some hiring committees at Harvard at the time. And you know, I felt like there were clear ways that I could be engaged through that role. Um, so if I think back on that period of my life, it's a period where the balance got really skewed towards other types of service, other types of institutional affiliation, which of course is something that I've been very fiercely protective of, of not becoming, <laughs> you know, I, I don't trust being a company man, but it was um, a weird moment of, of feeling like that was a point of contact to an ongoing institutional and social space that was engaged with the world, whereas the art world was shut down, in my experience. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, I, I was, in networks of people who were organizing, you know, I went on some bike rallies in New York. I, you know, there were there was a lot of kind of activism, but in terms of um, arts direct role, I, I didn't feel like there was a way that my work could be in the public space in that time, and so um, it shifted me. I know that was a long winded response. No, but I mean, I think especially, I mean, as you said, if you don't, if you're shut out of your studio then, you know, that sense of retreating to the studio is impossible. And so it makes, it makes, you know. I learned a lot about myself because I've always, you know, yeah, like the obvious, I, th I think I've in the past have like joked with people that one of the attractive parts of being an artist is the travel, <laughs> which is, which sounds like a callow, terrible thing to say, but, um, I don't travel for holiday, but I love going weird places to do shows and things. And it's been a big, and I do have this weird life with like, I have an apartment in Berlin and New York and Cambridge and I bounce around and I'm always on the train and I, I'm on the road a lot, although I, um, I know that some of that is performative. I know that there's this quality of like everybody showing up and being on this kind of moving circuit. Um, oh yes. Oh yes, I'm familiar with the circuit. It was, actually, you know, it's, it was great to be set free of some of the expectations of being in different places, but it was also strange to be alone in one place for the longest time, I think, mm. in the last decade of my life. And I always have ways of working on the road. I'm like very good at like being in Tokyo for a month and taking materials and working on drawings. But I somehow wasn't able to do that in my own apartment. Or some, I, I don't have an answer for why it was, but I, I think that I spent the first month lying to myself and to everyone who asked me and saying, oh yeah, yeah, I've got materials here, I'm working, I'm making drawings on the kitchen table. And I think I even thought that I was intending to do that, but um, it became really clear when I got back in the studio what a, what a block it had been and, and how much weld of energy I had. So I think it... Um, yeah, I mean, I miss my office so much so much more than I ever thought I would, you know, because, you know, you think when you're, when you, I think it's a similar situation where you think, oh, well, working from home is such a, um, such a luxury, but when it's the only option that you have, it can make your world feel a little small. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I know I had a very hard time, like, especially at first, like focusing and, and writing you know, and working on real work at home, um, probably, and you know, I was used to being able to go into my office to do that, mm -hmm. um, and kind of having, you know, a bit of a, of a boundary. Yeah. I mean, I, one of my favorite classes I teach is, is this class called Painting, Smoking, Eating, and it's all about the kind of space of the studio. You know, we, we talk about Richter's Atlas, but also, Gustin studio in Woodstock and this idea of the conceptual space of the studio that's like tuned into the world but separated out and it's you know, for 10 years I've been talking about that idea with students but then I really understood in this moment that the partitioning is super important to me 
and I was taking for granted exactly what you were saying, that it was the continuity between my living space, teaching space, and studio space that made the studio space formless. And um, so I guess, I don't know. Did your sense of time shift also? Like, or did this, or did the schedule of teaching kind of help to, to keep the days from just blending into each other? It kept the days structured. I was really grateful for that schedule. I mean, it's, it's funny. I was really grateful for that schedule. And then I had a crisis after, because I, I then went on sabbatical. So now I'm facing this really unstructured time, which normally would be organized around projects. And um, all of those got, got set aside. <laughs> so yeah. it's hard to, I, I, I know that I'm not alone in having crisis of, um, kind of self-reflection about what role one's work plays in the world for obvious, you know, kind of political reasons now, but even just the kind of being unplugged for a couple months. Um, it's not, I think, I don't know if anybody wants to just like plug back into the same socket. And nobody quite knows what the sockets are right now. I mean, I'm using nobody, but um, you know, I, I think it's really remains to be seen how our economy is going to shift. Who's who's going to reopen? Yeah, all of those things. Yeah, it's a lot of there's a, the uncertainty. I think is is a big source of um, of a lot of people's anxiety of having. I don't know if you had like projects that were canceled or postponed. Um, but I think that that's, that sense of just not knowing is a really, uh, you know, it's a hard thing for a lot of artists. It's a hard thing for a lot of other people uh, as well, but I think it is, um, I don't, uh, yeah, I mean, there's this question about what we get back to, like what's, what, is, what does it look like sort of when, when we do go back to some sort of semblance of, of normality. Um, yeah, this is a, and this is a really self-absorbed <laughs> thought. I, I think, you know, the art world is so active. And so I used the word performative earlier that I do think that projects sort of self-justify themselves either in their conceptions or half the time when you're talking about your work, you're talking about it in terms of where it's going. So I feel like it's been so long since I was just making work in the studio that had no destination in mind. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's a romantic silver lining to all this that, that you suddenly have all this time setting aside being locked to the studio and all the other stuff. You know, I was excited to have all this time to be working on what I want to be working on. Um, but so much context of contemporary is so contextual now that I think work that's made in general or without a clear sense of, an ex of a context often is missing the kind of boundaries to push off of or some you know, structures. And so when I talk about a kind of existential crisis, part of about what my work is for, that's like being alone with oneself, getting into things that are not specifically like meant or precon preconditioned for this or that exhibition and then wondering if when people finally see it if they'll care <laughs> if there's anything there you know it's, like, it's almost back to being like like feelings I remember as a student when there was no outlet mm -hmm. and you were just working on what seemed compelling to you and you sort of believe in yourself um, but it's been a really long time since I've um, had that much space between um, a, a public showing and the and the things in the studio. I have much more work that nobody's seen or even thought about seeing or even heard about from me <laughs> before. And it's like, it's weirdly disconcerting. Um, you wonder if, but it, it, it's also great. I mean, I, I, I do feel like this has been a kind of um, super difficult time, but I think it's doing really important work in our society and institutions in terms of, you know, hopefully leading to other and much needed change, but I think um, we'll all somehow be formed by this time and, and yeah. be better for the stumbling block.
to use the yeah like what are we going to tell like the america the artists you know of you know 100 years from now about you know like about this time like what are we going to how are we going to be sort of articulate it mm -hmm. um and i think that yeah it is interesting like i think that there i'm i've been struck in my conversations with a lot of people that people have found silver like sort of weird moments of or or elements of positive um you know maybe maybe only in hindsight you know mm -hmm. where people weren't feeling you know we're now we're talking in september no one was feeling positive about anything in march or april or may but I think as we're starting to to move in a little bit it's not in the rearview mirror yet but it feels at least i think in this part of the country like in new york it feels a little bit less um of an immediate existential threat now than it did and i'm curious i'm curious if you have thoughts about are there narratives are there other narratives that kind of have been overlooked in all of this that, that um you know whether that's i mean i don't know of course because they're overlooked um, you know this is a thread that i feel like I'm, I'm i've been sort of seeing little bits of sort of like what the things that people manage to to do as part of it whether it's like a coping mechanism or like the turning their efforts in some kind of positive you know, sort of positive direction, like as you did with teaching and sort of institutional service work. Um, and it's not really a question. <laughs> I, I don't know, and this is probably not your question at all. Um, I teach at a very privileged place and we were able to mail the students supplies and mm -hmm. The university sent computers and iPads to people who needed them. And um, lingering behind all that, of course, is the great sense of, of like what the access to the technology and the resources means when it's not right at hand. And so when it, one of the things that's laid bare is that sense of access in, which we all know, but it's, being experienced on different fronts. The battlegrounds are different, the places where it's clearly seen are different. And I, um, I feel hyper aware of that and, and hyper aware of the, um, uh, like the studio wars that were going on, especially before 2008, you know, but like of the, it, the materialism of the art world in the sense of like conspicuous, uh, apparatus, <laughs> conspicuous access, um, whether it was travel, whether it was other things, that was really part of the narrative, which um, feels, when you look at it closely, it feels so wrong, so ethically wrong. And, and I, um, you know, even just looking at the public programming of different institutions and the way that, um, you know, or the way that our classes were able to bring in crazy visitors. The silver lining for, for teaching online was you could zoom in the most extravagant um, <laughs> or most interesting, or most far flung, you know, that the, that the budget for bringing a visitor shifted to, to just pay for the time of the honorarium of the visitor and took it away from all this like demonstrative air travel and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if the art world will catch up with that. I wonder mm. if, like if we will, um, I wonder like who's getting access right now that wouldn't have had access before to some of these mainstream conversations, but then also how people's kind of experience of um, changed material circumstance will, will shift their, their behavior. Um, yeah, for, I mean, we're all wondering about, I, I was on a, a collector invited me to join this UBS round table about um, online art fairs. Oh. It was super fascinating. It was, you know, it was like a, Zem, a Zoominar, whatever you call it, and there was a lot of discussion about it from people saying, clearly this is the future, but we needed something to kill the past, and COVID has done it. <laughs> like, COVID has killed the insistence on the art fair, and now we can move into a more rational economy. And wow. Yeah. 
you know, it was, it was quite intense and from different criteria. And I was, I keep thinking about that moment. I, I certainly have nothing profound to say about it, but I keep thinking about that sense of like the moment that shifts, that accelerates things in the direction they're already going. Um, Wow. Well, I think that's actually a perfect, uh, a perfect closure <laughs> for this. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with me. And um, it was good to talk to you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um,